Hello, everyone, and uh, welcome to the Valero community meeting uh, slash open discussion. Today is a very, very special day uh, because this is the first time we're doing it in uh, the Beijing time zone. Uh, so super, super excited to start this, uh, this uh, series of community meetings. We're doing the community meetings for Valero. We're, we're uh, scheduling them on a biweekly uh, rotation. So the first and third Tuesday, uh, we have it in the, the America's time zones. So, um, uh, and then the second and fourth Tuesday or Wednesday, if you're in Beijing, uh, Wednesday morning, we have it in the Beijing time zone. So super exciting. And I wanna thank everyone for, for joining today. Um, super excited to have you all here. We're gonna run this as a, uh, uh, a the regular Valero community meeting. So same thing. Um, um, on every week. So we're gonna go through some status updates, we'll do some discussion topics, and then we'll do shout outs. So if you have anything that you would like to talk about, any status updates that you wanna bring up to the team, things that you feel are important to share with uh, the, uh, the larger team and the larger community, and things that you want to discuss as well with the larger team and the larger community, please add them to the Hack and D. Uh, also, please add your, uh, your name and affiliation to the HackMD there, uh, it's very, very useful for us all. Again, there we go. All right, so we're gonna start off with some status updates. So first off, we have Daniel. Uh, yeah, uh, I, I've been working on a new feature called Valero Debug, um, which helps uh, the communication between developer and the user. Uh, so user can issue this command and uh, collect the log bundle um, to uh, easily uh, bundle all the log files in one tarball and send it to a developer. Uh, I'll do a, a, a quick walkthrough and demo later. And uh, uh, one thing I didn't mention, I also enabled the stale bot in the uh, Valero repo uh, such that if uh, an issue has not been properly labeled or not responded for 60 days, um, it will be marked as staled. And uh, if the uh, uh, staleness uh, continue for uh, two weeks, it will be closed automatically. Uh, the goal is to help us uh, control the backlog of the number of issues. That's all. Awesome. Thank you, Daniel. Any uh, any questions or comments for Daniel? You know, we had some discussions around the stale bot. I think it's great um, uh, to have that implemented and uh, yeah, essentially get rid of old issues that uh, no one is responding to. So uh, I think it's a great feature. Thank you for that. All right, next up we have Bridget. Hi everyone. Um, so as I mentioned in last week's meeting, um, that I spent um, the majority of the last week uh, catching up on community support and responding to various issues, Slack discussions and so on um, that we haven't um, been keeping up with uh, recently. So I think we're all mostly caught up now. Um, so thanks everyone for, for your patience there um, while we get through that. Um, aside from that, I'm now preparing for the Valero 162 um, release. Um, so I left a link to the milestone there. It's not going to be a very big release. Um, it's mostly just um, some build script changes to allow um, to allow us to customize um, the registry that's used. Um, so we can customize the, the registry that Valero will attempt to pull from uh, by default, and we can configure that at build time. Um, but it's also going to include some security fixes as well, which various members of the community have let us know about. So I um, hope to get that out this week. That's it for me. Oh, great. Any questions, comments for Bridget? All right. Okay. Okay. Uh, I'm doing some uh, enhancement for the uh, E2E test. Mm. I have uh, enabled the uh, E2E test uh, on GitHub action for the pull request. 
uh, we test several uh, versions of Kubernetes provided by Kant. Uh, but but I I I saw uh, some red, random case failure uh, currently. I will look into this issue. Uh, so if you got it, uh, get it, get it, get it, get this issue, uh, you can just uh, rerun the job and uh, pass the checking. And the next uh, we will uh, set up several uh, Jenkins pipeline to do some regular uh, E two testing to cover more uh, providers and uh, 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 scenarios. And uh, we'll add more uh, test case. Mm. Uh, that's all for me. Awesome. So is this building upon the, uh, the work that you did here? Mm, yes. OK, cool. Um, one question. Um, so uh, currently we are not uh, setting those GitHub actions as mandatory, right? Or was the right one? I mean, you don't need to pass all the end-to-end -end tests to merge the PR, right? Yeah. But, but we wanna, you know, um, make those uh, the criteria for merging the PR by before we release 1.7, we need to make sure the end-to-end -end test pass for each PR. Yeah, makes sense. Okay. Right. Awesome. Uh, next up, Dave. Yeah, still working on upload progress. Wait, my camera's off. <laughs> um, yeah, still working on upload progress, um, fighting with Go. Um, and we're working on uh, release planning for, you know, the 1.7 release, as well as uh, 1.62. Um, any questions, comments for Dave? Are you, um, uh, would you be able to demo any of the, the upload progress in a community meeting too? When something actually starts working, yes. <laughs> I'm still at the, I'm still at the, hey, let's get the code structures right. So it's gonna be a little while. Okay, okay, yeah, sounds good. All right. Um, does anyone have any other status updates that they uh, want to share? All right, then let's dive into discussion. Uh, sorry, yeah, sorry, just a comment. Uh, I would like to thank Bridget to uh, spend uh, many efforts to support the community. Uh, I think that is a lot of questions and uh, in Slack or and uh, on GitHub issue. And so, and uh, as well as uh, Daniel and uh, Vinkai also spent uh, many efforts in the past week to review the issues in the GitHub. So I think uh, many of the issues have already uh, been updated by then. Yeah, I would like to thank them for that effort. Absolutely. Thank you, everyone. Uh, all right, Daniel, uh, do you want me to pull up the uh, the document here or do, you, or do you want to share your screen? Uh, I, I'm ready to share my screen. All right, I'm just going to stop sharing. There you go. Um, so uh, you can see my screen, right? The Google Doc? Yep, looks great. Okay. Um, so uh, this is the draft of the design that uh, I plan to transform into a markdown and a, a red hub a PR. Um, so uh, the goal of this uh, uh, Valero debug command is to help user uh, uh, easily collect a log uh, of different components of Valero and uh, the resources that are uh, helpful for um, debugging um, um, to help uh, you know, uh, simplify the communication between the lateral user and developer because uh, oftentimes the user open an issue and they collect some logs and developer tell them, no, we need more and back and forth, back and forth. So this is a shortcut the user can run this command, collect everything that should be helpful for the developer to debug the issue. Um, uh, as for the uh, uh, content or information to be collected, they will 
try to collect Valero deployment logs, Rustic daemon set logs. And uh, if user uh, specify the backup or restore, we'll also uh, collect the uh, definition of the uh, specified backup or restore uh, resource and logs and additional resources uh, such as uh, BSL, pod volume backup, pod volume resource. Um, uh, the one thing I'm not very sure is the vSphere plugin lock. We'll talk about it later. And uh, the way we uh, handle that is to uh, leverage a tool called uh, Crash Diagnostics. Um, that essentially uh, is a caller for a Starlack script, which is a, a dialect of Python. So um, you can write a Starlack uh, script and um, there are some uh, internal uh, function to help you communicate with this uh, Kubernetes API and uh, collect uh, logs and, and uh, uh, run commands or um, collect the definition of different objects. Um, so the idea is we're gonna uh, upgrade a Valero to be compiled using Go 1.16 so that we can embed this uh, script into the Valero binary and uh, uh, use CrashD as a library to uh, call this script to collect logs. Um, so that's uh, uh, overall how it works. Um, uh, in details, um, we, uh, we can implement an option to you know, trans translate the uh, parameter um, of a Valero command line to um, the arcs that we pass to a uh, crafty and uh, then um, uh, use those uh, values to control uh, what items we want to collect and how we collect them. Uh, one tricky thing is the kube config uh, because uh, Valero CL, in Valero CLI, we allow user to set the path to kube config as well as the context. At the same time, uh, because we use client Go, um, and it respects, uh, it honors the uh, uh, environment variable and all the default values. But that's not how CrashD works. Uh, as far as I know, a crash D, uh, for CrashD, you need to pass the a path of the kube config uh, to the function to uh, make sure it's used for the subsequent calls to the uh, Kubernetes API server. Uh, so um, the way we want to make the uh, parameter in Valero works for CrashD, uh, we plan to uh, generate a temporary kube config file uh, based on the user setting uh, um, and feed it to the CrashD. And after the command ends, remove the file. Uh, there is some, uh, I, I mean, Dave uh, mentioned that we may want to uh, update CrashD. That's an option. I will talk to them, but uh, uh, I don't want this feature depends on uh, the merging the PR because I expect there's a lot of back and forth because um, there are other uh, tools depending on CrashD. And uh, if we change the way uh, it's triggered, um, there may be some pushback. Yeah, it's pretty uh, standard though that if you know you pass in a cube config or you you know if you pass in like an empty cube config, then it goes ahead and and looks things up from the environment and so forth. Yeah, yeah, but but that's not how Crafty works. I need to look into the code, but uh, yeah, that's an option. I would say I'll write have an issue and. Uh, hey, we, we run into um, right. security problems, right, with writing the user's credential out to a file, even if it's only temporary. But but we do not, uh, I mean we do not uh, expose new stuff because those information are already on the user's file system. Not necessarily. What happens if it's like in their environment, or um, we're running like inside of a container where we're picking it up from like the cluster environment? I, I wouldn't. I I don't think no, it's no. a good uh, idea. I I know, but but that's maybe the only way to make things work. And I, I would like to point out it's not happening in the container. It's in, uh, it's acting as a, uh, it's ha it happens on the client side. It works as a client of the Kubernetes API, part of the Valero C 
fail. Right, high. but that means we can't like run it, you know, like log into a container and run it or something. There's a, I, I, I just, this just doesn't, this isn't, doesn't smell good to like copy. The I, I understand, I understand the concern. Yeah, yeah, I thought about this, but currently this may be the only way. I will talk to the crash D maintainer and see how things go. But the progress may be very slow. I think keep things in the Valero command line is uh, uh, the way uh, that is more manageable because we own that repo. Yeah, I wouldn't, see, yeah. I wouldn't write a file. Um, but what if that's the only way it works? Do we, do we want to block this until Crash D accept the change? Or we can discuss offline, I think. Yeah, but I mean, yep. there. I mean, we just yeah. pass in. I mean, if it's if it's the cube config points to a file, then you just pass in the the path that was in cube config, right? Yes. So I'm not sure why we would copy it. Uh, because user may may modify the uh, context. But uh, in Crafty, you cannot uh, set the context in the cube config. It only read the default one. Yeah, so. Yeah, it, it's, yeah I, don't I don't think it's a good idea to copy it. I understand, <laughs> but we will see. I mean, we have some option to, you know, uh, uh, talk to the uh, Crafty maintainers and see how they think. But, yeah, probably we add an optional, uh, I mean, an optional uh, parameter uh, to specify the context. So probably that's acceptable to them. We'll see. Um, okay. Uh, uh, so the plan for the implementation, I will first bump up Go and uh, embed the startup script and implement the command and add end-to-end -end test. Um, so I'll do a quick demo. Um, so this is a, a compiled uh, Valero. Uh, you can see there's a new sub command called debug, and uh, Did you do currently the, uh, with a bigger text because I ideally see uh, the the text on your screen. Uh, excuse me. Let's say it again. Could you use the bigger text font? Because I, oh, I, I can see. see your screen. Is that better? Yeah, um, that's good enough. That's good enough. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Um, yeah. So it supports currently three uh, additional parameters. The output is the path of the bundle turbo, and the, the backup and restore where you set the name of the uh, backup or restore uh, object and the logs of this. And uh, um, I can use this command. Valero uh, debug, I set a, a backup so that it will collect this uh, log of this uh, backup and uh, all this uh, default, uh, all these resources and uh, running. Yeah, this is output of uh, Crash D. It, you know, essentially under the hood is calling the Kubernetes API to collect all the information. Yeah, you know, that may take a, a while. Mm, it's slower than last time I tried it, but okay. Yep. And if we go to this, uh, there's the tarball, the target. Uh, uh, 
unfortunately, um, the path is a little bit long uh, because um, this is how correctly works. Um, I create this uh, temporary directory uh, on the uh, operating system and uh, it collects everything in this folder and uh, tar it. But I think that's uh, good enough for you know debugging. And uh, yeah, here are all the logs and uh, you know the uh, information uh, collected by the crashd. So um, we can easily uh, update the uh, crashd script and to make it collect more resources as needed. Um, one tricky part is also raised by Dave, so, which is also a good point, is how we collect the log of uh, uh, vSphere uh, plugin. Um, um, based on my understanding of most of other plugins, all the pods are running inside the Valero namespace, but vSphere plugin is not. It has a really uh, a tricky scenario um, where uh, there is a guest cluster and supervisor cluster. Oh, that's, so that's I, completely crazy. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So ideally, user issue some command and to this guy. It may also collect, uh, you know, logs of these guys. Um, we can push it to the vSphere plugin developer. But I think that will make them, uh, I mean, it will yeah, I'm not, I'm not as concerned about yes and supervisor, but even just in a regular cluster, um, we wind up with like the, the scale out data movers and um, the backup driver running in its own pod. So okay. what would be, uh, you know, I was thinking that we could just make a mechanism where the plugins could return a, another Starlock script mm -hmm, that mm -hmm. we just run. Um, I'm not sure how to do that well though, since we're on the command line and the plugins running over, maybe it just, maybe it just writes it out. You know, it doesn't have to be dynamic, right? So yeah. maybe it's just something that it writes into the, um, the container directory or something. When they come and, up. And, yeah, yeah, I understand the idea, but what if I make a little modification to this script to make sure it collects the log of backup driver and data mover on the oh. same cluster? Well, you could, That's but I think we're going to have other plugins that may have the same thing. I think like OpenEBS, for example, has its own uh, kind of a fan out thing. So it'd be nice if we could make it a generic. Okay, yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll double check. I'm not sure if we can trigger another uh, start up script within one. Maybe you can use the SQ file or function in Python, but I, I need to take another look. But that yeah, I, I will uh, start the conversation with the with your plugin team and uh, try it. Yep, that's my part. Any comments? Uh, I have a quick question. <laughs> my maybe uh, just, just a clarification here. Uh, so basically, the Lero will run some script to them out to you know, them, the class them and everything, right? So mm -hmm. does that uh, currently in the Federal already or you have to enhance Federal to run the script? And uh, what is the concern about some hacker might swap this script with, with something more um, damaging uh, to the backup store software? Um, uh, I, I don't. I don't think the hacker. I don't think the hacker can have higher privilege because, um, first, if you wanna uh, interact with Kubernetes API server to do any destructive action, you need certain role in Kubernetes, and you need a kubeconfig file. That's the key. Um, you know, to do it, and uh, even we provide this uh, script in plain text and make user run it. It doesn't. Uh, it, you know, increase this, uh, uh, what did I say, uh, attack. Uh, well, I, you know, I think possibility of attack. A possibility, because the idea being that if, if uh, you're able to override the script somehow, and then when the user runs a Valero command, they run a bad script with their credentials, right, Fong? I, yeah, basically, uh, we, if the user unknowingly running their hacker script instead of this script or some version of this, some enhanced quote unquote version of this script, and uh, they might, you know, take a take a look at the data that's being backup, and that compromises security of the backup software. 
So like um, this script is actually compiled into the Valero binary, right? Correct, uh, using this uh, uh, go embed mechanism. So it's in the binary, so it's not easy for user to modify. Oh, okay. so, so it's not like a script that will you know, be located somewhere on the pod or something like that, right? It's in no. the binary itself, okay. Yeah. So it's not quite script, in, but it is more like a part of a short code already, right? Okay. Yeah. Yeah, because the, the, the idea of, you know, the binary executing some script uh, that can be changed during runtime is a major concern uh, for I see. security. I see your point. Yeah. Maybe we can check some, you know, add some shard check. I'm not sure. <laughs> but, but currently, I, I, I think I can engage some security engineer to do the review. But I think using go embed is probably good enough. Yeah, I think the one that's, that's compiled into the Valero binary, that's probably fine. Yeah. And then if we let the plugins provide scripts, we'd have to have something that we have to think about that a little bit. That's a good point. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for the comment. Any other comments? Uh, Jonas, will we move on? I'll stop sharing. Sounds good. Thank you, Daniel. Uh, all right, next up we have Fong. Oh, okay. <laughs> so do, you, do, you wanna, do you wanna share your screen or should I uh, pull it up here? Yeah, could you pull up the, the issue that I, I was, um, I, I raised this issue last week um, in an informal way, uh, and then I filed uh, the bug. Uh, and after looking to it a little bit, I, I saying that um, um, the the priority class is is a Kubernetes uh, class. It's not like a CID, like a customer CID or something. So um, when a pod is using it, and if the uh, destination cluster where it being restored doesn't have it, it will cause a problem. Uh, so my 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 uh, point here is I, I I think we should fix it in a variable code instead of um, write uh, a plugin to handle the case because uh, not only for this priority class, but I think we, we can um, make it general um, enough so that uh, if an entity like a pod or a deployment referring to some uh, cluster resource, cluster scope resource, we should backing it up as well if that um, if that is uh, if the the the, the flag including uh, cluster resource is set to nil, um, because that is you know the way we design the the function of that flag is that if it if uh, an entity um, including some known resource cluster resource type we should include it in the backup, right? And in this case, clearly that <clears throat> PyGD class is not um, a CID, it's, 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 a, it's a Kubernetes uh, class. So uh, we should include it. That is my point here. Yeah, I was gonna say, since I was the one that originally suggested the, the plugin, I don't know that there's a generic way of doing this. Um, here's an example where, you know, you can look in the spec and the spec calls for this kind of association that we can follow, but I still think they're all one-off cases that we have to identify. Here's a case where uh, Kubernetes resource references another Kubernetes resource that's cluster scope. We need to handle this. Um, I think you can make the argument that because these are Kubernetes, core Kubernetes resources, Valero core should handle it rather than a you know, third-party plugin that each person that's using this would have to write. Um, and then it's an implementation detail, I'd say, whether if we decide that Valero core should handle this, we might implement that as a, you know, backup item action plugin that is in the main Valero code base, or we might put it in backup.go, but that's an implementation detail at that point. Um, but I don't think there's a generic way to say anything that we're backing up that has a reference to anything that's the cluster scope resource. I think we have to actually identify a pod spec in this field might reference something that this is the type, let's handle it. Um, those are all kind of one-off, I think. 
Um, but if they're all core Kubernetes types that anyone using Valero would run into, I think you could make the case that Valero core should handle it. But I still think we'd have to individually implement those on a case-by-case -case basis, starting with this as one example. Makes sense. Any thoughts, comments there, Juan? Uh, the I, I, I the main thing was that that the the um, the authority class is a uh, is a part of a, a Kubernetes core, right? So um, whether it is you know one off uh, that we should handle or we should make the the level code is generic enough so that it it including all of the cluster resources that being used by any entity and add that into the um in, into the you know part of the main main data path is a backup um i i still lean toward that you know if it is a, a core class uh, we should include it in however uh, uh I I haven't dipped, dipped into the code enough to say uh, how are we currently doing it um, because uh, I know for sure that if we hit like a, uh, if we hit like a PVC right and we will dig out the PV right uh, it's which is a cluster scope right? and then so on and so forth so uh, the same thing with the uh, you know, cluster role binding and all that. Um, uh, so this variety class may not be, um, you know, much different from those type of cluster scope being used uh, by the entity in the name space. So that's the parallel, you know. Yeah, yeah. I, I think you're, I think you're right in terms of what should be handled. I actually agree with you that this is something that we probably should put into Valero. Um, I'm not aware of a generic way of doing this. The examples you gave, which Valero handles, are handled specifically by looking at PVs and PVCs and looking at you know those specific resources and places we know to expect them. But I mean, the in, the intent of include cluster scoped um, resources to the default you know nil option is to do exactly this. You know, because if you say true, you include everything in the cluster. If you say false, you include no cluster scope resources. And if you leave it blank. The default is to pull in things as relevant. And I think this is an example of something that Valero probably should be pulling in as relevant. Um, if you can come up with a way of doing this in a generic way, that's great. I just, I don't know of a way right now. Um, I mm. would know how to write it as a plugin. And, and I would argue that if you write a plugin for that, we should include that plugin in a Valero release because like you said, these are normal Kubernetes resources that anyone backing up a Kubernetes cluster would want to include um, if they're setting the right value for in cluster scope, in, including cluster scope resources. Um, Valero internally has several backup item action and restore item action plugins that are implemented as plugins, but included in the product because you know we need to do this for all backups and restores, but the easiest way to implement it may well be to write a plugin that is then supported in the Valero release. Um, so that, that, is a, that is a kind of, middle ground between a generic solution that works for everything, which I don't know, you know if it exists, and a third party plugin that's not supported. Okay, it sounds to me that we have an agreement, an agreement that the priority class should be included in the uh, backup, if it, yeah, is, I, it, if it yeah. is that in the way that we, um, you know, if it is set up with the uh, include priority, uh, I mean, include cluster role, as right. cluster resource as a meal. Right? Yeah, I, I and, agree. Uh, I, th I think it should. I just think the yeah. only way to actually implement that is to write code that's included in Valero that specifically when backing up a pod looks for a priority class because that, that's okay. not a generic thing. That's a spec field, you know, in the pod spec that you'd yeah. have to know it's there to look for it. There's no generic way to tell Valero, hey, find everything that's cluster scope that might be referenced by something in your backup. Um, because these are all specific Kubernetes models and specific resource types. Um, you know, just like, for example, we have custom code for CRDs. Anytime you're backing up a CR, 
we include that CRD in the backup. Um, yeah, I, I, I agree with that. you that uh, plugin may be the, the best way to add on this functionality, right? Because uh, otherwise, um, the devil will have to know every single Kubernetes core type. You know, priority class is one of them, right? Otherwise, we have to un each of the, each time the, the part using some core, it have to, the developer code has to add that in. And, and the way to do additional, you know, development is, is using this plus in. I think that might be the best approach. Yeah. Uh, so and remember that there's two paths for plugging. So one is what most people are thinking of, which we supply a container and it runs externally to Valero and it gets called via gRPC. The other plugin though, is actually compiled into the Valero core. There's yeah. a number of backup item actions as Scott had mentioned. And so mm -hmm. this really is part of core Valero. It's simply yeah. implemented through the plugin interface. Yeah, exactly. That's what I was trying to say. In other words, I think you want to distinguish between, you know, is it a plugin? That's an implementation detail. And, and then there's the requirements question. Does this belong to core Valero? Should Valero do this thing? And I think the answer is yes. Do we, do we implement it by writing a plugin as part of core Valero? Maybe, but that's an okay. implementation detail. It, it's probably okay. cleaner to add the backup item action. I think this is actually like, if, if I think of this, this would be like backup item action for pod. Yes, exactly. And, 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 it, and it would return annotate, priority yeah. class as yeah. additional items. Yeah, exactly. It's yeah. very easy to write as a plugin. Uh, and that's okay. why I was- Well, as, as a backup item action, let's, let's exactly. not say so plugin you're, because that kind of gets right. into this Got GRPC yeah. thing. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. A backup item action, you're right. But, but, it, but, it, but rather than, you know, putting it, as a you know, third-party plugin not supported separate container. Okay. It's something that I think, I think belongs in Core Valero, but mm -hmm. probably implemented as a backup item action. Back, you know, backup item action. I, yeah, I think it'd be that. easy enough. Okay. So there's a backup item action and a restore item action would need to be written. Um, um, you may not need a restore item action because once you the backup item action gets it included in the in the backup, okay. and then yeah, once it's the, the backup, um, the, the CR the priority class should just get. Okay. It restore. I mean, if, 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 you, if we need to change the content of it for some reason, then we need a restore item action. But if you just want to restore it as is, you probably don't need a restore item action. Right. So I guess the only, the only thinking would be, you know, do users expect that if they back up and restore these, um, you know, is this priority class going to get restored? Yeah. What happens if one already exists? Um, those kind of things would, yeah. would be something to yeah. think through. Right. I mean, if one already exists, that's the, I think the generic Valero answer applies. If it already exists, you know, we, we, we don't do anything with it. It's, we leave what's there. Um, I think part of the, what's going on here is that the documentation around include cluster, uh, cluster scope resources is if you leave it blank, then conceptually that means backup cluster scope resources that are related to namespace resources, which is what this is. Yeah. It's analogous to a PVE to a CRD. Um, yeah, or, or it's like back up the okay. stuff that you actually need, right? Yeah, exactly. Okay. It's, out to me, it's out to me that we have an agreement. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I'd say the issue as written, you know, would be the issue. And then basically someone needs to write a PR that creates a backup item action in Core Valero okay. and registers it. Um, and then that can be reviewed as a, you know, BR that, that does that. Okay, thank you very much. That's it for me. So, so could someone write a comment to the issue to document this agreement? Or I can do it. Shall we say this can be fixed by introducing a backup item action in Core Valero? Mm -hmm. that, yeah, that sounds yeah. good. Thanks. Awesome. Thank you. All right. Uh, next up, we got Eleanor. Yeah. So, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, Genting and Scott and I and Bridget were having a bit of a discussion about V1 and V1 beta one support. And it occurred to me, we're all here, so it might be best just to talk in person uh, since it looked like we were diving into deeper details. Um, the very short that I understand, and then I'll let Genting or Scott or Bridget say more. Actually, does, do any of you wanna just start by the explanation? Because I think you all have more context than I do. I mean, I can jump in uh, if someone else. So. Go, go for Scott, it. Scott, okay, sure. Scott, so, okay, so basically the issue is that right now for all of our CRDs, we're using the V1 beta one CRD definition. Um, V1 has been available since Kubernetes 116 and 
when 122 comes out, the V1 beta 1 disappears, which means the CRDs as we've defined them in Bolero 1.6 um, will not be installable um, and can be ready to 122. Um, the simplest thing to do would just be to, and you know, in addition to changing the V1 beta 1 to V1, there are certain CRD changes in terms of fields that have been moved around and you know, multiple version support. Um, most of that, you know, uh, the framework is generating that for us anyway, but the point is the actual CRD file on disk is going to be different. Um, the simplest solution is just to make everything V1 only and abandon support for V1 beta 1. Um, the downside to that is Valero 163, if that's where we introduced this, will no longer be installable on Kubernetes 115 or older. Uh, and I know when this first came up, some of the comments from, I don't know what I mentioned, that we'd actually rather have a larger um, you know, window of supported versions, uh, specifically to handle the case of migrations where people are getting off of older versions and moving to newer ones. Um, the downside to that approach of, of adding both is now you have additional testing requirements. Um, I know the Helm chart in particular, probably we, we would have to be with you and only, but for the installer, we could introduce, in fact, the PR that's out there from Genting now, it actually does maintain both V1 beta one and V1 support works for both. Um, I've run an end tests with both um, and you know it works that way. Um, again, the, the only downside really to that is additional testing overhead. Um, but the upside is you now can maintain that support all the way back to 112, which is our current minimum supported version. So that's, that's kind of the basic decision that we need to make around that. Um, it sounds like for the Helm chart, we're gonna have to do EV1 only because we can't have two sets of CRDs, but for installer-based um, installation, um, we have that choice of support both, because a better, bigger range of supported versions, but more testing overhead versus supporting just the V1. And that would mean that Valero 163 and newer would no longer be installable um, on Kubernetes 115 and older. Yeah. And I'll just add, oh, can I just say um, one thing that uh, Bridget and I had talked about this uh, when Bridget helped me understand the ratio originally, and it felt like, okay, with this additional testing burden and who, who uses such old versions, now hearing about the additional users who might need to do those older migrations, I wanted to hear what folks thought. And of course, those of you who are working on the testing, I'd love to hear what additional yeah. testing burden there might be. And now Dave, it sounds like Dave had something to add as well. Yeah, well, the other thing is moving forward, you know, we're planning to update and add new um, CRDs. So are we going to back, you know, we're gonna add support for these back to 112 and then test versus 112? And I guess I would ask another question, and I don't have a lot of background on this, but up until now, what's been the general way of kind of deciding what that kind of supported range was? Because then at one point it was, you know, you know, recently we 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 got we supported 110 in newer, and then it became 111 in newer, I think, and then it became 112 in newer. And some of that was, you know, we added validations, and some of those validations weren't. Because I know, again, just to for the specific Red Hat use case where we use this for our migration tool, we actually are using Valero out of support. We're actually, um, because we have a U customers that want to go off of um, OpenShift 3 and that's Kubernetes 111 and older. And we've actually just modified the CRDs for those three clusters to remove that validation because the only thing that, you know, actually breaks in Valero right now when Kubernetes 111, for example, is that CRD validation. We pulled that out, it doesn't break. Um, so we done that knowing that it's out of official upstream support because we have customers that need to pull off of those older versions. Um, one way of handling this with a migration case, though, is to say we're not going to support Valero, you know, older versions for, say, 163 and newer, but we explicitly want to support backups from 162 on those older clusters to be restored in the newer clusters. So that's another way of approaching this. And I think that's something we need to do anyway. Yeah, I would agree. Um, you, you, mm -hmm. you, you don't want your backups to no longer work because you happen to be moving to a new version of Valero. I think that's something mm -hmm. we do want to be testing. I don't know how much that's being tested now, but. Uh, there's a bit, but not a lot. And so we definitely need to keep that in mind. And, and we're probably going to be I, making some changes in the formats and stuff. Yeah, exactly. Um, and, so the backwards compatibility becomes something you actually have to work at. And that becomes a much bigger issue if we're saying with the V1 CRDs, 
we no longer support you know, 115 and older. Yes, but I think that that's, so I think one of the things we need to understand is are people, you know, what's the expectation on the lifetime of like yeah. these Valero backups? Um, you know, our default time to live is 30 days. So <laughs> yeah, oh, that's, that's another yeah, issue. But, yeah, that, but, that's, but that's something that plays into this. But I, I would prefer to, to handle, I, I think we need to handle backwards compatibility of the backups. That's a basic yeah. expectation. Yes. And we can make a decision now, you know, we, we can always drop support for the V1 beta one CRDs later. But the question is, you know, are we going to, as we add new features, we add new CRDs, if we don't, if they don't work in V1, you know, we're going to have to now add them in two places, right? Yeah. I would say also, if we're treating this as a, you know, this is a 163, it, it, it would kind of worry me that 162 works on, you know, 115, but 163 doesn't, because it, that feels like the kind of thing you want to break at a major release. Um, All right. But, it, you know, that, but the, I understand this is a one-off, you know, this is a one-time thing. This is kind of a big deal with the CRD change. You know, this is not a normal... I mean, we, we, since the code works, right? If it already works for these, we could just say this is a one six three thing where it works for V one beta one and V one. I mean, I mean, and we have a PR. One, seven, yeah, I was, I was saying we have a PR out there now that does that. Now, what I don't know, and maybe Jen can answer this, I don't know what the burden is going forward when CRD changes happen to make sure that gets created for both. If this is just a question, well, no, of what I'm thinking is it. that in one in one seven we go right. ahead and and break and get rid of the V one beta ones. Yeah. That, that, that could make some sense. I mean, I, I know that was one thing Eleanor asked that this is going to be a problem for the Red Hat use case. And I, and I was going to say, we're hitting this issue for our migration side with our own CRDs too. So you know, we're wrestling with the same question. And one of the things we're considering is exactly that, to say, look, the version of our products that upgrades to the V1 you know, CRDs is not going to be supported for you know, OpenShift 3. Um, but for the migration use case, the source cluster needs to run the older version of the product and they need to work together, which is kind of the same thing in your case of the backup works, but we mm -hmm. don't need to worry about restoring. Um, so that, that, that would make sense um, to, to say. And also by the time 1.7 comes out, I don't know if that's gonna be after, you know, Kubernetes 1.23 is out. I mean, if, if you're looking at the number of, cause that was one thing that concerned Nolan had at one point was uh, one of the comments on the early comments on, on this issue was, you know, a certain, I think it was like he didn't like the idea that we would only, yeah. Just so you know, November, I think is 123 and 17 will come out in September. So it'll come out about two months before. Okay, so, 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 got it, yeah. Yeah, so, so we still, you still have that issue that again was, a, this is this was just a concern Nolan raised. It's not necessarily a Valero concern as a whole, but he was saying, look, we only have six Kubernetes versions that we support across that felt like a small number. Uh, I don't know again, how valid that is. I mean, the other point was, hey, this has been out for two years. So anyone on, you know, 115 is on a two-year-old version of Kubernetes. Um, and, you know, at that point, um, that's more of a migration concern than a backup and a restore concern. And as long as we're supporting backups there, that may not be a huge problem. Well, it sounds like we're, we're in a position right now where we can support both, the code's there. So it would make sense to me to do that for 163 at least. And then we have to take a look at one seven whether or not we start to drop, you know, the support for the V one beta ones. We could kick it to one eight. Um, as long as we're not adding a bunch of stuff, it probably yeah. doesn't affect us too much. That, that, that also um, gives us a longer time window to sort of test the question of again those backups working in the newer version. Yes. Um, and again, and again, to be clear, it sounds like we can't do that for Helm chart. So for Helm chart, we would be V one only, um, just because. Uh, it sounds like in that case, you need one version of the CRDs that you install. Yeah, and that seems reasonable yeah. enough. I mean, if you're using a Helm chart, you know, with an old, old Kubernetes, there's some point where it breaks, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, exactly. I think we, I think we agree that we don't worry about that. Yeah, as far as historically, you know, what versions of Kubernetes were supported, we probably have to ask Steve or Nolan, but the feeling I get is that we just never said we never changed the, the release number until it actually broke. So yeah, that's that was right. basically the policy. Yeah, and, and we're hitting that point now where we have to worry about it. Um, so uh, do, we, do we have agreement now? Um, let someone write it up. But I, I do have some uh, small concern regarding support, supporting two 
versions in one six three because we probably don't have much time for testing in one six three. Oh, and one other point I would add this of some relevance. I do have a PR out there that updates the end-to-end -end tests to support running with either v1 or v2. Basically, it adds a parameter to sort of pass that through so that you can run the end-to-end -end tests at least and choose, OK, run end-to-end -end with v1, then run end-to-end -end with v1 beta 1, and it runs with either one. Um, doesn't solve the support problem, but again, it's a, it's a factor there that does make it easier to at least run tests in both cases. So I don't know if we've got agreement, but we've got stuff on the on the table. Daniel, you want to think about this for a bit, yeah. and see if you have. Uh, and I would say one other point about the testing and support is that since one six one is already out and one six two is coming out soon, that's all fully tested with big one beta one because that's what that's what we've been using for years. Um, as long as and, and so the concern for testing right now is just does do these does the same code that works with v one beta one also work with v one CRD? Um, because that's really the only change for 163 is basically using supporting v1 CRDs or v1 beta 1 CRDs. Um, when we start talking about 17, now we're talking about new features that you know developers are going to be using the v1 CRDs by default now. And so with v with 17 and later, we have this question of regressions on v1 beta 1 and testing overhead. But I think for v for 163, I don't really see as much testing overhead there because. The only thing that's new is the V1 option, and that's what we need to make sure works. Um, V1 beta 1 CRDs already work, um, and that's not being changed. Mm, but, uh, I mean, yeah, but, but, yeah, but I, I heard that. Upgrades are one thing, too. We need, we need to test, so that's, that's one thing. I don't know how that, that will work. Uh, but but, but uh, I heard that for 1.7, we should support V1 only. Do you think um, we need to support? We're considered. We, Dave was suggesting we may want to consider V1 only. I think we haven't made a decision on 1.7. We don't have to decide that today, you know. But for 1.6.3, we need to figure out our plan. How do how do we handle 1.6.3? Um, and it sounds like, the, you know, Dave was suggesting maybe we want to go ahead and support this sort of dual CRDs that um, and Jen Ting's PR for 1.6.3. But by by the time 1.7 comes, maybe we're ready to drop um, V1 beta 1 support completely. And that gives people some time to sort of adjust to that expectation. Okay. But 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 I, th I think I think if there are questions about the testing and, and of the current PR with supporting both v1 beta one and v1, if there's anything else that needs to be tested, is there any risks of doing that versus? I mean, to me, it almost seems riskier to say it's v1 only because then you don't have the fallback because if you're supporting both and someone has an edge case where hey in my cluster the v1 doesn't work i can fall back to the v1 beta one which should work pretty similar to what it did in 162 um but, I, but again that's just a i'm not sure um, i didn't look through the pr very closely before but um so from the command line, is this going to detect which version is installed and generate the right resources? Like when you say backup, full arrow backup, it needs to decide whether to create a V1 beta 1 CRD or a V1 CRD, right? It, uh, at the install, installation, if the uh, Kubernetes server is available, it will uh, detect the uh, Cube API server preferred it, uh, CRD API versions. Yeah. For, for example, like uh, if you are bigger than 1,000. No, no, no. I understand it at install time. Uh, but, yeah. at, but when you actually say like uh, Valero backup, doesn't it have the to backup, generate the, the correct CRD? The correct uh, CR? I believe be yes, because it's related to the uh, Frankie did the feature before that uh, the uh, variable will choose the preferred API version for backup, if I remember correctly. Frankie, what do you think? Sorry, could you repeat what the question was? So here's my, here's my thinking. So um, we're gonna install either V1, a, VR, V1 CRDs 
or possibly V1 beta 1 CRDs. So there's going to be Kubernetes clusters that don't support V1, right? So we're going to install V1 beta 1. Okay. When you're at the command line and you say Valero backup, that writes a CR. Mm -hmm. But it has to write the correct one, right? It's, yes, it's it either a V1 yep. beta 1 or V1. Well, well, your CR is whatever the Valero version is, though, right? I mean, because. Well, but it has, if, if you're running on like 112, it has to write a V1 beta 1 CR, CR well, right? Well, it's the, it's the CRD that's V1 beta 1. The CR yeah. is so, so, so the Valero backup CR is whatever doesn't version change. that we say it is. Okay, so the, the, so the CR itself doesn't change. It's just the CRD that is changing. Yeah, so when you create um, a okay. CR, um, it's, it invokes the Valero API. So that's the, it's like valero.io slash v1 that's in the version field. Yeah. Okay, so, so it's all based around the CRD version is what right. we're worried about here. Exactly. It, it, but it's the we've group got to version. install in both, in both cases and make sure that the CRD actually defines the CR correctly. Yes, um, uh, 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 but again, I, from what I've seen, the CR itself should look the same in both cases. And I, I got as far as running end-to-end -end tests using both V1 beta 1 and V1 uh, using kind. So, you know, mm -hmm. skipping the ones that kind skips. But other than that, things were successful running there. Um, yeah, I don't again, think kind actually skips anything. Well, maybe the, yeah. yeah no. I, th I think it's just the, I think the only thing I think, well, I know there's some things that are skipped. I think the only thing skipped on kind are the, um, the snapshot, um, you know, issues which don't really interact intersect a whole lot with um, the Valero CRs. So, but you know, the point is the basic kind, you know, backup and restore with Restic, um, and then the the kind of GVK tests um, and all of that. I was able to run those using an end test with both V1 and V1 beta one. Um, I mean, that that was with my PR that I added, which allows you to set that on the end-to-end -end tests. Um, if, you don't, if you don't choose that, um, then you're gonna be using the default, um, which we're, we're setting to be V1 when it's supported. So I assume it sounds to me, I, I mean, maybe Dave was saying that, or it sounds like, Daniel, do you want to talk a little bit more about the testing side of it? And we can kind of maybe continue this conversation in the Slack thread. Would that make sense? And of course, we can continue in two weeks when we're all back together in this meeting. So from my understanding, for 163, at least we should test only V1, right? If that's the case, I think that's probably doable. If, as Scott said, um, there's a flag to control it. Uh, well, so. well, so so the so the the PR as written, uh, Genting's PR lets you install either one, but V one will be installed by default. Um, and then I have a follow on PR that when you're running the end to end tests, it lets you run end to end tests by choosing V one beta one or V one. But again, V one is V one is what you, what's run by default. So, okay. um, if if you install if if Genting's PR is merged. And nothing else changes when you run end to end tests. Um, you'll get V1 um, with my follow on PR. Again, if you run end to end tests without specifying version, you'll get V1. But you could also run end to end tests specifying V1 beta one uh, as the CRD version. So you can show that you know the end to end tests run successfully both using V1 beta one or V1. Um, and and I would say again V1 is our priority because that's what, you know, for 122 you have to have and V1 beta one only really matters to users that are on 115 and older. So, uh, so Genting, yeah. Yeah, so, so your PR and Genting's PR must be merged into 1.6.3, right? Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Genting's is most important, but, but yeah, I mean, my, mine lets you run in end test. So I, I would want those both together. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, they, they don't, they don't touch the same files, but my PR has to have his merge first, otherwise, because it, it references changes he made, Understood. so my PR won't you know, fail without it. But, Understood. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so <clears throat> my understanding is, Scott, you have a PR to enable the ability to for 
to test uh, the V1, V1. But uh, for officially, we only need to test uh, the V1 and the uh, native community know in 1.63, we only support the V1. Uh, by default, we will support the uh, V1. Mm, no, I think we need to test both. I mean, if it doesn't work, oh. we're gonna have to come up with another. So, so the, the reason for supporting both is so that okay. we can say we have backwards compatibility from 163 forward or 163 okay. with both. And, you know, if you can't install 163 into 112, then it's, or it doesn't work when you okay. install it. It's kind of silly. Okay, yeah, so yeah. with that, uh, with that uh, we, we also need to test the both in 1.63. Yeah, I think so. Um, Okay. And, 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 and I think part of that too is we're trying to get 163 released soon. And, you know, it would be nice to give people that are on older clusters some warning to say, okay, 163 works for you, but 17 may not. You know, we're deprecating this or whatever. And I'm not sure what the, what the wording is here, but um, th this gives them some time to sort of, you know, decide what to do about that. Because um, 17, we're saying we probably won't support both at that point. Um, although I don't think we've made a final decision there um but i think for 163 given that i think we're trying to get that released relatively quickly um I, I, it would make me nervous to say we're not going to support v1 beta 1 anymore especially since we have a pr that seems to do that and work well for that but again obviously there's the testing needs to make sure that we can claim that it actually does work okay. yeah I, I, I assume this is the first time we uh face this situation. Maybe in future we will still have many, um, I'm not sure many, uh, this will happen again due to the Kubernetes uh, version support. So this is a practice I think we, the first study we, we can know something about this. That, that, that's, yeah, that's, a, that's a good point because at some point there may be a V2 CRD comes out and yeah. we may not have that, you know, two years of, you know, coexistence to, yeah. to be able to be as confident later to say, hey, we can get rid of V1. I would suspect that the pressure is going to be even higher on V1 to V2 to like not break things. It's a lot more yeah. usage at this point. Yeah. All right. Um, should we uh, wrap up this discussion, continue in Slack uh, with, the, uh, with the notes and everything here? Um, so I've only got um, one small thing and then uh, some shout outs and I know we're over time so apologies for that. Uh, some really good discussion here though so I hope you all enjoy that. The, uh, uh, the discussion topic that I have is around maintainership and governance. Uh, so I would like to uh, see if we could add uh, Daniel and Wenkai as maintainers. Uh, it would be up to a, a current maintainer to nominate. Uh, so uh, Bridget will nominate Daniel and Wenkai, uh, and per our governance, we need a super majority to vote for this. So we're asking uh, all the maintainers to cast their vote as well. Um, regarding the governance, we've had some discussions around the uh, wording in the governance doc, and uh, starting next week, essentially, I'll um, see if I can review it a bit, uh, see if we can... Um, reword a few things, uh, make it a little clearer, make it a little, uh, also a little more open on, on what a maintainer um, agrees to do. Uh, so instead of doing all of these things that we currently have in our uh, maintainer description, uh, I want to make sure that we can say you should do some of these. Uh, maybe you have other, uh, other uh, responsibilities within the project as well. Uh, that way we can open it up for uh, more maintainers who do different things within the project uh, and also uh, open it up a little more for uh, sub-project maintainers uh, if, that's a, an, an, if that's a concept that we want to go uh, towards as well. But I'll open up a PR so we can have discussions around this. Uh, again, changes to the governance, e even small ones, uh, need a super majority agreement. Any questions, comments? I just make just a quick comment on that. Um, sure. I think now that we're talking about um, you know, opening up to, to kind of different focuses, it, it would make sense to me to encourage, you know, getting someone on the maintainers list, for example, whose focus is more on the testing side. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, 
that could include actually running through tests, but also contributing to the end-to-end -end tests and others, because just kind of a more of a QE focus there. Um, that would make sense to have someone a maintainer that has kind of that focus. I like that, Scott. I think that's a great idea. All right, awesome. So the last thing here for today is gonna to be our shout outs that we do every time. Yes, sorry, Eleanor. Only, I don't know. I mean, just, I know that Dan Fung is, is maybe new. Sorry if we already did this introduction and I was not paying attention, but Dan Fung is gonna be working more. Um, maybe do you wanna introduce yourself? Cause it's actually perfect with uh, Scott's lead in. And not that she's a maintainer yet, but uh, she uh, has a similar background. Dan Fung, am I putting you on the spot or? Uh, yes. Uh, yes, I, I will responsible for um, maybe on uh, some CICD and uh, E2E test. Yes, and also I add a Jenkins pipeline for um, security check uh, and it works, uh, it works yesterday. And uh, I will show the re report to, uh, to, to team members. Yeah, that's all. And so what's really cool, so Dan Fung is, was on the Harbor team for the past few years, uh, focusing on end-to-end -end tests from what I understand, and now she's moved over to Valero. So I think we're going to see a real increase in, in the quality of our testing, which is amazing. So welcome, Dan Fung, and you'll probably see her a lot more around. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dan Fung, and, and thank you, Eleanor. Um, all right. So last thing, shout outs. So the, we got four shout outs here. The first one is here for, uh, from Daniel, uh, enabling the stale bot here. So thank you for, for doing that. Really appreciate that. Uh, as we talked about, the next one is from Jen Tang here, uh, upgrading the cluster binding uh, to use the V1 API. Good stuff here. Uh, next one is from Tarek. Um, who created uh, within the Helm chart repo. So he added uh, the functionality of allowing disabling schedule and value overrides. So when you have a multi-layer environment, um, you can disable a schedule that is de defined in a commons values file. So thank you for that, Tarek. And next one is again from Jen Ting here, a quote string uh, in the Helm charts uh, fixes a certain thing. I think this was, uh, we talked about this a couple of weeks ago uh, with uh, uh, in, an, uh, in an earlier shout out. This one from Fong. Thank you so much for, uh, for doing this one. Uh, no, we, uh, this is an issue. Never mind, not a shout out. We already had a discussion about that. I'm getting tired. It's late. So with that, Thank you everyone for joining. Have a fantastic rest of the week. Uh, this has been lovely to see you all today, uh, the first Valero uh, community meeting in the Beijing time zone. Thank you everyone for joining. Have a fantastic day. Bye. Bye. Bye everyone. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye.